All right. Welcome back, everyone. So some interesting news tonight. Now, you might remember we talked about how, well, you're going to have a lot of un unfilled roles uh, very soon in the National Guard. Well, not in the military in general, in government agencies, in key services across the U.S., in hospitals and so on. Uh, because, again, the Biden administration has now mandated that people across any company that has more than 100 employees, uh, government employees, medical workers, military troops, etc., mandated that all of them have to get the vaccine um, or basically get fired. They're not calling it getting fired. They're saying unpaid leave. And so indefinite unpaid leave until they choose to get the vaccine. Now, this is raising a lot of issues across the United States and around the world because you're having it so that a lot of positions are being left unfilled. One of these areas is, of course, in hospitals where some hospitals can't fill, they can't get enough people. In New York City, they've been talking about filling some of these roles with National Guard or importing people from other countries who can fill those roles. I will see how that goes, especially if other countries also have similar issues. But something interesting is now happening, which is in the U.S., um, well, not everywhere, but in some parts in Connecticut right now, they're going to start bringing in the National Guard to fill in empty seats, empty roles within government agencies. And so, folks, you're going to have a lot of our government now in some states, in some areas, possibly run by the National Guard, run by the military. A very strange development. Um, I don't know if you call it martial law, since martial law would mean that the military takes over, uh, takes over the systems of law. But this is martial government, which is a very interesting situation to be in. I'll be detailing this, a lot of other things with this. Also, folks, some other interesting things are happening right now. The Democrats are very, very divided over this budget plan. They're, of course, talking about multi-trillion dollars and spending $3.5 trillion dollars for one of their plans, and then an over a trillion dollars again for the infrastructure plan. But within the Democratic Party itself now, there's a break taking place. And the far left individuals, the squad, these socialist groups, they want this kind of spending. They want multi-trillion dollars in spending. Others don't want it. And Biden is now saying that after talking with them, a lot of people are going to be left unhappy within the Democrat Party. Um, there's a lot to talk about with this, especially as it relates to where we're going financially, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, really, we're on the brink, very likely, of some massive economic shift. Something big is happening, and I'll explain some of the telltale signs of that. And also, folks, another interesting thing is happening. In schools across the United States, you have parents now protesting uh, going to their board meetings, calling out the teachers, calling out the administrators for teaching things like critical race theory, for requiring students to wear masks, for requiring things from their kids that they don't believe the kids should have to be doing. And how are the schools reacting? Well, folks, one of the largest school boards in the country is saying that these parents should be listed as terrorists. That is the actual word they use. They want them to be listed and investigated as domestic terrorists. So folks, if you're a parent and you oppose critical race theory or you believe your kids should shouldn't have to wear a mask, one of the biggest school boards in the country is advocating that you should be labeled a terrorist. I'll be detailing that. I'll go over the direct quotes from their letter because they're, they are calling on the federal government itself to actually in investigate this. I'll be detailing this, a lot of other stories, folks, so stick around. First, I wanna jump into the first story for the night about the National Guard taking over parts of the government. And folks, wild times we're in. Hey, we're in it together, right? <laughs> hey, Roseanne Dunn, he said, homeschool. Actually, great option, to be honest. Interesting fact. Did you know that around 11% of the kids in America now are homeschooled? Uh, it seems that part of the you know working from home, staying at home, learning from home phenomenon that started under COVID actually got a lot of parents to start looking into homeschool. Homeschool is taking off in the U.S. More than one out of every 10 kids now in the United States is homeschooled. Incredible, right? Yeah, Susie Q said, hi, family, and Joshua. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, folks, you're great. Yeah, 1A, 2A, Tia, you said National Guard in hospitals. Yeah, that's happening too. 
A uh, very bizarre situation, folks. There's a weird takeover of the government taking place by the military. I don't know if I'd call it a military takeover because government itself is putting military into these roles. Uh, but it's very strange, and there could be a lot of implications with it. Let's detail the first story on this now. It says here, Connecticut to deploy National Guard to address staffing shortages due to the vaccine mandates. And it says here, Connecticut, Connecticut's governor has directed the National Guard to replace state employees who will be placed on unpaid leave, a.k.a. fired until they choose to get the vaccine, uh, placed on unpaid leave starting next week due to their noncompliance with the COVID-19 vaccination mandate. Governor Ned Lamont, a Democrat, announced on Wednesday that he has directed executive the executive branch state agencies to prepare for placing their employees in unpaid leave between October 5th and October 11th. If they do not provide proof of COVID-19 vaccination or comply with weekly testing requirements, according to the statement. In other words, they, they don't necessarily have to get the vaccine. They can still get weekly COVID tests, uh, which some people might choose to not get. And they're saying this, folks. Lamont instructed the Connecticut National Guard's Major General Francis Evan to prepare for the deployment of the National Guard to state agencies that, quote, provide cl critical health and safety services uh, if they become short of staff. If deployed, if the National, if the National Guard is deployed, and done, this, is, this isn't just Connecticut, they're all stomach doing similar things in New York and other places. If the National Guard is deployed, qualified members of the Connecticut National Guard, in Connecticut in particular, would supplement the operations of those understaffed agencies until replacement employees are hired or employees placed on unpaid leave comply with the vaccine mandate. As of Thursday, and this is interesting, as of Thursday, 63% of the state's roughly 32,000 state employees have been fully vaccinated. 12% are undergoing a weekly testing regimen, and 25% are in non-compliant status. So you hear that, folks? Only 63% are choosing to get vaccinated. That's Imagine you have 10 people in an office, a little over 6 out of 10 of those people um, are going to have the vaccine. That means roughly speaking, right, roughly 4 out of 10 if you have 10 people in a room, four out of those 10 are not going to get the vaccine. And if you understand also that only 12% are going to agree to the testing regimen, that means 25% are non-compliant unless they change their minds. What does this mean? It means that a quarter of these government agencies could very soon be filled by National Guardsmen, members of the National Guard. Uh, which means if you have 100 employees in an office, 25 of those are going to be members of the National Guard. It's interesting. I, I, I don't know if this says a lot about the, the skills of the National Guard or, frankly, the lack of skills of the people they're hiring for these government agencies, maybe a bit of both. Uh, but typically, you would, ex you would expect these government agencies to need people with specialized skills. Maybe they can find those in the National Guard. Uh, but it is an interesting thing that, well, what does this mean as well? Unlike normal employees for government, right? Normal employees, you can kind of choose a lot more carefully what you choose to, let's say, enforce, what you choose to do or what you choose to not do. Um, whereas military typically has to follow orders. Now, these National Guards members are going to have to follow orders. And they're going to be specifically under the directives of the uh, the governors of these different states. Um, there's, of course, some overlap with this. It used to be the case that the National Guard were almost like the state militias. They're, they're technically the state armies. Uh, those of you outside the U.S., it's important to note. The National Guard, so in America, of course, we have the federal military. You have essentially two militaries, one East Coast, one West Coast, and then several branches, of course. And then every state also has its own military. That is the National Guard. Uh, because every state is basically like a little country in the United States. Every state functions like an independent country, but we have this additional government, the federal government, over it. Now, these National Guard's troops typically have to answer to the governor, 
But under some of the different changes they made to the law, including on you know, Afghanistan and so on, the war on terror, the federal government can actually now control the National Guard to an extent, which means you're going to have a lot more, in another regard, federal government control possibly over state governments and over essential services within states. This is a very strange development. Um, the other side of this, I'm, I'm not saying there's any intention behind this, but the other side of it also is actually have another interesting phenomenon, which is U.S. troops, including National Guards members, are sworn to do what? Uphold the Constitution and defend the nation against enemies, both foreign and domestic. And normally you would think that would mean that they could oppose things that they view as unconstitutional and enemies that they view as being enemies of the Constitution. The entire narrative around what is an enemy domestic, uh, again, especially under, again, these new domestic terror laws that they're trying to form, has changed. And I've also been told by individuals within the military in the United States that they're being told directly now that it is no longer their role to interpret the Constitution. And so if you're a National Guards member, if you're a U.S. Marine, we'll get into some stories on that hopefully. If you're a member of the U.S. Armed Forces and you've taken an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, you're no longer allowed, they claim, to interpret it as you would normally interpret it. Which means, folks, they're being directed on how to interpret it unless they choose to do otherwise. And if they choose to do otherwise, they might end up in the brig like one of these military officers currently is for because he called out the top leadership for their bad decisions in Afghanistan. Folks, a lot to be going into on this. Um, we talked again about what's happening in Connecticut, but it's not limited to just Connecticut. We also see this in other parts of the U.S. and very likely a, a policy that's going to be expanding. Again, even New York is talking about it. We'll see where this goes and I'll keep you updated on it. Now, folks, I mentioned before, we're still demonetized by YouTube. But luckily, though, we do have sponsors. And tonight's episode is brought to you by Secure. Over 155 million Americans were affected by data leaks in 2020. The average American had their data stolen about four times over the past year. People, of course, get anxious because they don't know how to protect their online data or their online activity. But now there's a new email and messenger app that can do this to a pretty good degree called Secure. That's S-E-K-U-R. It can give you privacy and security for sending emails and messages. Secure's server and data center are hosted in Switzerland because Switzerland has the strictest data privacy laws in the world, even if a foreign government like the United States in the case of Switzerland, or even if a foreign law enforcement branch wants to request your emails or your chats, uh, not only is it very difficult to do in Switzerland, but they actually have to alert you. Uh, there's a lot of different laws there that would protect you in Switzerland. Secure is also the only private and secure messaging in email app that does not rely on big tech companies like Amazon, Google, or Microsoft, which means not only it's not subject to whatever they may be doing with your data, it also means it's not subject to the U.S. government's Cloud Act, uh, which could also expose your data to, again, monitoring. Secure does not ask for your phone number, does not mine your data, does not upload your contacts, as all, almost all applications of the kind tend to do. And Secure Messenger functions by adding people you know and then adding their secure numbers. If they don't have an account, you can send them an invite. In this way, you're protected from hackers getting into your phone and you also have full privacy while on the app. It costs only $5 for the messenger and only $10 for the email and messenger package. You can visit secure.com today for a free seven-day trial or use the promo code Joshua to get 25% off. And big thanks out to Secure for sponsoring tonight's episode. Now, the tea tonight, by the way, is a uh, it's Taiwan mountain tea. It's wonderful. Actually, my producer brought it back from Taiwan for me. Now, I mentioned some of what's happening with the National Guard and in some parts of the U.S., in Connecticut, in New York, taking over, it seems, we'll have to see, it, it's not fully rolled out yet. It's in the process of happening. Uh, they're going to be rolling them out and essentially taking over some key services. Some key services in the U.S. are now going to be under the National Guard or partially under the National Guard. 
you also see some other telltale signs that something interesting is happening here, um, especially as it relates both to, well, let's say security of the country and for possible crisis we're facing at various levels. Folks, an interesting development is now taking place in Texas because the police in Austin, Texas, are no longer responding to calls that are not emergencies. This is actually a policy you've seen implemented in a lot of other parts of the United States, including in, well, to an extent in New York. If you walk around New York, it seems like borderline anarchy combined with totalitari totalitari uh, totalitarian, totalitarian, or Orwellian, you know, social controls. It's, it's a very bizarre situation. But folks, you're seeing this spreading as well, that police, because they're understaffed, because of the vaccine mandates, because they don't want to go to prison for trying to arrest someone and having someone record them, uh, a lot of them are just not going to take risks anymore. A lot of them are no longer policing in ways that are non-emergencies, even in parts of the U.S. theft uh, up to, again, over $900 of theft in San Francisco, by the way, is now decriminalized. A lot of things that are crimes, prostitution, have been decriminalized in a lot of parts of the U.S. In New York, in fact, if you walk around some neighborhoods, I was in Jackson Heights not too long ago, you can see prostitutes openly soliciting services on the streets and nothing is done about it. Um, in fact, if you walk through Times Square, you can watch people shooting up drugs on the street and police have to sit there and watch them do it and there's nothing they can do about it. A lot of forms of crime are being decriminalized. And even more than this now, police are saying that for non-emergencies in some parts of the U.S., they're no longer going to be responding. Now, this has already been happening to an extent, regardless of the vaccine mandates and police possibly losing their jobs if they refuse to get the vaccine in some areas. The vaccine mandates are going to make this even more tight for them. Let's talk about what's happening in Austin. It says here, police officers in one of the largest cities in Texas are no longer responding to calls that are deemed non-emergencies as of October 1st, as of already in place now, in other words. In situations when there is no immediate threat or to life or property, residents and others in Austin are being told to submit a report online or call 311 because a call to 911 will not yield a response. So, folks, unless there's a threat to your life or a threat to your property, the police ain't coming. Now, the change in policy stems from recommendations from the Reimagining 911 and Non Police Crisis Response Interim Austin Chief of Police Joseph Chacon told a briefing this week. Those are the policies specifically. Reimagining 911 is one policy, <laughs> reimagining it in that it doesn't respond to you unless. Your, your life is in danger or your property is in danger, whatever that means. And also the non-police crisis response. <laughs> so non-police crisis response. Think of what that means. This is, this is government language. If there is a crisis and there needs a response, it's not going to be the police. That's what that means, folks. Non-police crisis response. They're not responding. That's a nice way of saying it. Now, the chief of police in Austin also cited concerns about COVID-19 exposure for officers in the public, a lack of manpower due to challenges hiring enough officers, something I've been warning about, because what happens if they can't get enough officers? Well, if you're going to have social chaos and so on, they might need a federal response to it, right? Like maybe some new federal level system of police, possibly. I don't know. Nothing's been announced from me. We'll have to see. And folks, they're also citing a jump in 911 calls this year from previous years. And what else are they doing in parts of the U.S.? They're making it so that you can report your neighbor if you see them, for example, holding social gatherings, for example, over the pandemic and so on. So you have two different sides to this. You have the enforcement of policies that are not normally crimes, COVID crimes, I guess you could call them. And you have the decriminalization of a lot of crime that is pretty serious and the releasing of prisoners from prison. Something was happening since before the elections in 2020 and during the Black Lives Matter riots that swept across the country. And they're also trying to take away your gun so you can't defend yourself. So <laughs> interesting combination of incidents. Guess what else is happening in addition to this? U.S. officials, 
Another story here. U.S. officials are quietly preparing for 350,000 to 400,000 migrant encounters at Mexico border in October alone. Now, folks, remember what was happening with this migrant crisis? 250,000-ish, 200,000 or more people illegally crossing the U.S.-Mexico border every month, over 200,000 a month. That number now is jumping upwards of 400,000 this month. Now, this happens, of course, also as the Supreme Court ordered the Biden administration to restore Trump's policy of remain in Mexico, meaning that if people encounter border patrol, like these 400,000 people are going to be encountering them, they had to send them back to Mexico for wait to, their case, to wait for their cases to be upheld. Guess what, folks? The federal government is ignoring the Supreme Court's order. Now, if the, if the federal government is not following the law, if they're not following the Supreme Court, then what are they going by? That's an important question to ask. While they're not obeying the Supreme Court, they're not obeying a Supreme Court order. This is an extra legal then policy, one which is taking hundreds of thousands of people and resettling them across the United States. And even as part of some negotiations, including in parts of Texas, making it so that they're not even allowed to test these people for the virus. Uh, of course, they're not mandating any kind of vaccine for them. While the average American is, of course, being forced to either get the vaccine or possibly lose your job or have your rights denied to basic services. 400,000 this month. And folks, this is continuing and it's on the upswing. Remember previously it was 200,000 to 250,000. Now it's 350,000 to 400,000. And if that trajectory keeps going up, uh, expect things to get interesting real fast. Already this is more than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Now it says here, is from all sides. It says the Biden administration's Department of Homeland Security, which is notably again ignoring an order from the Fed, from the Supreme Court, uh, Trump's policy again of remain in Mexico. They're ignoring it. The Department of Homeland Security is quietly gearing up for a surge of three hundred fifty thousand to four hundred thousand migrants in the month of October, according to a report from NBC News. And believe the border could see a huge influx of activity if the Title 42 COVID restrictions on asylum lifts in February. Or sorry, lifts on Friday. And I'm sorry, Friday, not February, meaning this week. Interesting developments, folks. You'd think that maybe they're not worried about people spreading the virus if they're letting in people on this scale uh, without any need of vaccination, without any need of being tested. And not only are they so little concerned about this, that they're even taking them and busing them around and putting them in different parts of the U.S., uh, including small towns all across America, and ignoring, again, legal orders from the Supreme Court itself, which means this is an extra legal policy now being practiced and being enacted. Uh, well, again, the average American is being told a very different story. Now, in addition to this, 400,000-ish people coming to the country illegally, in addition to the hundreds of thousands every month, in addition to police not responding to calls unless something serious is happening, in addition to them offering free health care to illegal aliens in most parts of the U.S., even if it's not directly provided through the uh, through through the uh, system of the emergency rooms, homeless people and illegal aliens, because they're not in the books, get free health care anyways. What's going to happen? Well, folks will have to see. Where are these people going to be housed? Where are 400,000 people going to find homes, especially if they have no money? Where are 400,000 people going to put their kids, especially in the public schools? And you have shortages of teachers. Where are 400,000 people not being tested for the virus going to find health care and health services? when the hospitals themselves are understaffed. Um, you're gearing up for a very interesting government-made crisis on many fronts right now. Um, on Yeah, on many fronts right now. In addition to this, folks, there's some interesting things happening with the federal budget. And it seems to be the case as well that they're ignoring the fact that, well, we're already hitting the debt ceiling. We're already hitting the debt ceiling. 
meaning the federal government has reached the limit of money it can borrow. We're already seeing inflation. Inflation, they're not saying, is going to likely end anytime soon. We're seeing the signs of a global economic crisis because of what's happening in China, both with the real estate crisis, the bubble happening, uh, very likely a huge impact on the stock exchange, both because Chinese, uh, Chinese stocks are going to have to get investigated soon and held to tighter laws, and in addition to this international shipping crisis, which China plays a big role in and is also partly due to some bad U.S. policy, and also a few other things I'll detail in a bit. All these things are gearing up to basically create a financial crisis, the likes of which we may have never encountered before. And what is the federal government doing? They're in a, they're Under the communist system of dialectical materialism, everything in the universe amounts to nothing more than matter in motion. That means you and I are only clumps of physical cells. Our souls, emotions, mental health, and well-being are not part of the communist equation. Like how the moderate Girardins were among the first to die in the French Revolution, or how moderate Democrats are shut out by the Democratic Socialists of America. Communism favors the extremes. In traditional culture, it is two opposite elements working together in harmony to form a whole. However, this was inversed under the Chinese Communist Party. In the selected works of Mao Zedong, the yin-yang, which is normally a whole, is split into two, with each side constantly fighting and struggling against the other. and either the Eastern or Western spiritual view of the world. The course of human life serves to temper the character of the soul. An atheistic, materialistic reading of the world is that only matter or progress exists. Communism does not want you to have a soul.
Tonight I'm going to talk about the Judiciary Committee, the most powerful committee in the US Congress. A lot of people ask me, why all these communists in government? Why a pro-Chinese communist Black Lives Matter running riot on the streets? Why isn't the FBI doing something about these people? Because the FBI is overseen by the Judiciary Committee. It is the committee that they look to for guidance, sets their budget, etc. The Judiciary Committee is chock full of communists and socialists. We need to be investigating Congress members for violating their oath and working in the interest of internal communists and foreign powers, because it's going on right now. Wiping out the 4th of July, wiping out the Declaration of Independence, putting slavery as the basis of this country. How was it that it had such an influence? Because now it's being brought into education, all kinds of things. 3,500 uh, schools have these lessons prepackaged, taught to children, presenting this message that our founding was in 1619. What does the 1619 Project say, and what actually happened at Jamestown? These people were slaves. They were captured in Africa. They were captured by a warrior tribe called uh, the Ndango and by the Portuguese. And they were put on a Portuguese slave ship, which was attacked by uh, a ship that was captained by a man named Joe. How about we get people who are wealthy and big companies to pay more without taxes and give better service for the working poor middle class? One of the big questions in this country right now is the idea of, uh, I'd say, taxes and what are some of the alternatives? We have lots of bridges and tunnels in New York City. So I said, why don't we lease the naming rights to all of our bridges in New York City? I'm talking about a bridge that gets mentioned hundreds of times on the radio stations and TV when it comes to traffic reports in a 16 million metro person area. This idea of lessening the size of the government yep. in order to strengthen community and also people having the ability to take care of themselves more. That Our goal has to always be to create more community opportunities, to create an environment where you have extra competition with government. So the goal always is to break the monopoly of government. They do want everybody to get the vaccine, except if you're up coming across the border, which we have over 200,000 people every month coming across the border, those people come across with COVID. President Biden is looking to implement vaccine mandates across the United States. Employers with 100 or more workers to give those workers paid time off to get vaccinated. Since there is no law, the president certainly can't just make up a law and start ordering you to do things like get vaccinated. It's no longer about your freedom, it's about your safety. To protect us, he cannot overrule the Constitution. Those rights are not from him, those rights are from God. They're inalienable, they're given to us by our Creator, they cannot be taken away by any government. All right. Strange stuff, folks. <laughs> Thanks for bearing with me on that. Uh, my internet just cut out. Um, so we're actually having thunderstorms out here tonight. And so we're supposed to at least. I don't hear them yet, but I wonder if there's some kind of weird interference taking place. Uh, thank you for sticking with me. I apologize for that. Thank you all for still being here. Let's continue where we left off and then we'll go into some questions. Um, I'll just wrap up that last part because I was talking about, well, again, this budget plan they're talking about. Actually, let's jump into the budget plan after the questions. We'll jump now into the Q&A. Sorry about that, folks, and thank you again for sticking with me. Crazy stuff. I have no, that never happened before like that. Anyways, 
Uh, let's see here. We'll go over the we'll go over the questions now, folks. And so again, if you do have questions, leave them in the chat. We we'll try to get to them. <laughs> Don't worry, they didn't shut me down. I'm still here. Yeah, we're we're still good. All right, first question from Dave Johnson. He's a question. Any news? Any new details around the firefighter who was attacked by dozens of teens in Queens, New York, several weeks ago in the arrest? New York Post has been quiet on it. I have not heard updates on this firefighter. I do know that in some parts of the U.S., such as in Portland, they're talking about giving firefighters bulletproof vests. Um, the reason they're giving for it is they claim if they're if Firefighters need to respond in an area that is close to, for example, an area where there's been an active shooter, that they want to have firefighters with that. It seems like it's a bit broader than that. The reality is, it's very likely just like we were, we were talking about a bit ago. Um, you have a lot of understaffing in police departments. You have stand down orders to a degree being given to police to not respond to certain calls. You have issues like this. And because of this, you have, again, firefighters having to go out and respond to calls or and so on without maybe some of the protection they may normally be given. There are issues like this. I haven't heard updates on this yet, but this, these are some issues you're having already. Uh, next question here from Linda Manning, 092452. He said, question, I am on social security and also have a VA pension. If the government doesn't get things worked, worked, will I get paid? I'm 69 years old, and this is the only money I have to pay bills. Well, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, actually. You're going to have a few different issues taking place right now. If you're asking specifically about the vaccine mandates, this should not affect you if you're retired, of course. Um, if it's about, again, you, you being on a pension and you're worried about the federal government shutdown, the... Democrats and Republicans have worked out at least an interim deal so the government will not be shut down, but Republicans are making it, they're, and not only Republicans, but also some Democrats, they're making it basically so that with this plan of spending, they can't raise the debt ceiling. In other words, you're going to have to see government very likely cut back on a lot of spending, and it will see if it's even possible to continue doing what they're doing and to continue basically having the government function while not raising the debt ceiling, because this basically means the government can't go more into debt. Will this affect your pension? It's hard to say. I don't think we've ever seen this happen. Um, if you listen to what Democrats are saying, the ones trying to push it through and get the debt ceiling raised, it does seem to be the case that they're concerned about people not getting paid. We'll have to see how this goes. We're in uncharted territory is a nice way to put it. We're in uncharted territory in many regards. Now, will the government actually not raise the debt ceiling? They've done it before. Um, have they ever really shut down for that long? And typically, if they do shut down, they tend to pay people back. It always happens. Who knows? Maybe this is a different year than before. Maybe things have changed from before. Maybe the kinds of deals we saw get made before will not happen this time. Who knows? Typically, they will raise it. Typically, they will push it through. Typically, they will pass it. Um, it seems right now to be the case that, and I'll, I'll explain this after the questions. Right now, the case is that Democrats are basically getting ready to announce their proposed budget rather than spending $3.5 trillion. Uh, it may be like $1.5 trillion or less. We'll have to see. But the squad, the socialists within the party, uh, the real far left Democrats, they're can, they're really fighting right now with the more moderate ish Democrats again, because the socialist ones want this massive government spending because it entails their entire idea of kind of remaking America. Essentially. I'll get into the details on this in a bit. Um, the point is though, very likely one thing government is good at is keeping itself in business. So the chance of you not getting your pension, I'd say, is pretty slim on that note. The question is how much money can they give to the programs they want to push through, which is where the real debate is. We could see something break for a little bit, but we'll see how it goes. We're, again, in a lot of uncharted territory, so it's hard to say. Question from Cameron Bacon. He said, Josh, if the administration is not following the laws as upheld by the highest court, is it not the military's responsibility to hold them accountable? Well, 
you know, it's 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 a bit of a gray area with the military. Military, police, even technically public officials, they're sworn to uphold the Constitution. Now, if, of course, the Constitution doesn't just define your inalienable rights under the Bill of Rights, uh, notably rights which are beyond even, even the breadth of what is written within it, um, there, there are rights you're given with that are even outside the breadth of what is within the Constitution. It, the Constitution defines this. But the Constitution also defines the function and roles of government. And so if you're a service member in the military, if you're a police officer, if you're a government official and you've sworn to, up, to uphold the Constitution, you're not just upholding the rights that American citizens have. You're not just upholding their inalienable rights. You're also upholding the structures and limits of government. And it is true that if a certain branch of the government is not obeying the laws or is not upholding the Constitution and is doing things just as they see fit, essentially like dictators in this case, vi you know, violating even rulings from the Supreme Court itself, I don't know if, if anything could be done about it. Um, I, I, frankly, this is uncharted territory as well. Well, maybe not. I think it's, frankly, they violate their own laws all the time. Uh, could anything be done about it? Hard to say. Maybe if states sued, if something could be done. The problem is who holds them accountable. If, if the government itself is not obeying the law as it is, if they're violating the law technically, is it then even part of the you know, system within our constitution or is it an extra legal force essentially working as the arm of big government in this case? I, you know, we've seen smaller incidents like this take place in the past. To this scale, there, I don't, in my memory, nothing we've seen like this before. It's bizarre stuff happening, folks. Just put it that way. Let's see. This is from Michael Ulrich. He said, question, is it true that a Philadelphia representative is introducing legislation to require men to get, a, to get bisectomies after their third child or 40th birthday? Um, yes, I did read some of the articles on this. I did read the tweet from another representative in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, I should note the chance of this law getting passed is frankly pretty slim. But it's it's wild regardless. In fact, I, I was debating on whether to include this in the, in the story lineup tonight. Hmm. The reason I didn't include it, well, I guess I am now, I was because pro the chances of it getting passed are pretty slim, but... This does show to the extreme extent to which government law is trying to head with some of the more extreme individuals. The story on this, folks. In Philadelphia, there's a local representative who has introduced legislation trying to, allegedly, according to one of the other officials in Philadelphia, trying to, right now, making it so that if you have four kids, in other words, after your third child, if you want to have four kids, you have to be, you have to get a bisectomy. You have to be, if you're a man, you can no longer father children. Or if you, after your 40th birthday, you get a bisectomy, you can no longer have kids. They're trying to do this. Now, this may sound pretty far out, but keep in mind, in some parts of the world, they have things like this. And frankly, we're already following the China model to a large extent. If you understand the China's model for this, the one child policy or the two China policy, it works through things like this. You know that in China, under the Chinese Communist Party, the government tracks women's cycles. Do you know that in China, under the one child policy, there have been serious documented cases? Um, read the works of Stephen Mosher, for example, who was one of the first, well, the first known academic outside of China to get banned from going back to China because he got his hands on a bunch of documents around the one child policy. It was a policy folks. It didn't just involve like fining you if you had more than one kid. It was a policy where you and your family could be in the hospital. Your wife gives birth to a child. The doctor has to take your child and murder it. This is, this is, this is not abortion. This is post birth murder. They would take the kid and they drown it, for example, or they would give it lethal injections and things like this. That was happening in China under the one child policy. Uh, you had horror, horror stories where even in parts of the country in China, because 
part of the part of the CCP's policy was that if there was a village or something like that, and one person within the village had more than one kid, they would punish the entire village. And so you had villages that would get together and actually murder uh, the children if a woman, for example, had more than one kid. That's what that's what the one child policy actually looked like in practice. Horrifying stuff. There were some exceptions to that. For example, CCP members, if you're a wealthy uh, part of the wealthy elite, you're not held to the same laws as the rest of the country. And typically, those are the stories that are told to you by the mainstream media journalists and others who, frankly, are pretty much living in the Truman Show in China and presenting that Potemkin village allusion to the rest of the world and lying to all of you. Um, great works in this again, Stephen Mosher, uh, first academic outside of China to be banned from entering China because he went there and they gave him a whole stack of documents. It's a long story, it's an interesting story, uh, but he got a lot of actual documents from within China detailing these exact practices. And a lot of this is not a secret among people in China either. There are plenty of stories on this. It's horrifying. Now, you would think that, that is very far from us here in the United States. But folks in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, they're talking about this. They're talking now about, you know, full term abortion. Not, not the idea that it's a clump of cells that, you know, the idea that this is not a fully developed infant. They're talking about murdering fully developed infants now and selling their body parts, something they did not, they denied was happening, but they're actually doing now. It's, it, they lied to you. When they were saying they weren't doing this, they were lying to you. There's a business around it. They take these murdered infants and they sell their body parts. And you look at the officials making profit, invested in these companies, tied to these companies, getting votes and money and so on from these companies. It's, it's intermingled. And frankly, it's sickening, my opinion. But... In Philadelphia now, you have the first signs of someone pushing for the one-child policy in the U.S. or something similar to it. Here, though, this is a three-child policy. And if you have more than three children, if you're a man, you might have to get a bisectomy. You may be rendered unable to have children. That is what they're pushing for. Now, this, of course, for those of you familiar with some of the history on this, is eugenics. Uh, Margaret Sanger, one of the founders of Planned Parenthood, was a eugenicist and, frankly, a very extreme racist. Part of it was to cull the population of black Americans. That was Margaret Sanger, inspired by it, uh, inspiring even Adolf Hitler, right? Um, great book in this, Dinesh, Dinesh D'Souza's The Big Lie. Highly recommend. Anyways, um, yeah, they're talking about eugenics here in the United States under the guise of a three-child policy that is happening in Philadelphia. Another question here from Sean Fingerl. You said, can Arizona recall State Senator Michael Ugenti Rita, the Republican fa uh, failing the State Senate vote uh, to enforce the Maricopa County subpoenas? I believe Arizona is a recall state. How can they proceed with a recall? I'm not sure if I'm not sure if they can recall uh, senators there. I, I'm sorry if they can recall, yeah, senator, state senators there. They might be able to. I know I, I I have seen some stories in other parts of the U.S. where there are recalls for senators, uh, state senators. I'm not familiar if Arizona has a law that would allow them to do that, but it's possible. Uh, for those of you who don't know the story, basically you do. So basically there have been calls within the state Senate in Arizona to subpoena the officials in Maricopa County where, again, the audit just took place of the election. And they basically want to bring them forward and maybe even charge them with crimes. There's been talk about this and so on. Those policies have been blocked by a Republican state senator. Um, we'll see where it goes with this again. Questionnaire from Shannon Haney. One sec. Question from Shannon Haney. You said, is it true that the infrastructure bill includes farmers having to pay thousands of dollars per head of meat and dairy cattle? I have seen the articles on this. I did look into it. Of course, the mainstream media denies it, but of course, it's usually based on technicalities. It does seem to be the case that, yes, they are pushing. I mean, we'll see if it gets passed, frankly, because it's it's in a $3.5 trillion bill, I believe, and they're probably not going to get the money for it. 
I'll be detailing that in just a bit after the questions. Uh, but yes, they're trying to levy. And so if you if you read this new reconciliation bill that they're trying to get through right now, this three point five trillion dollar uh, reconciliation bill, in addition to the one point one trillion dollar infrastructure bill, the Democrats are trying to push. They're basically if you read the policies, it's basically like the Green New Deal. They're basically putting the Green New Deal into place. Everything the, new, the Green New Deal talked about, the Green New Deal talked about, is within one of these two bills, for the most part. Remember, one of the points in the Green New Deal uh, was, of course, the getting rid of farting cows, and we all laughed about it and thought it was funny because AOC, Senator Cortez, sorry, part of the legislature, Cortez AOC wanted to get rid of farting cows because she said it leads to greenhouse gases and so on. Remember that? We all thought it was funny. They're doing it, folks. Um, it seems to be the case that, yes, they're putting pressure on the meat industry. Uh, Bill Gates is, of course, running this whole new, you know, I can't believe it's not meat or whatever thing they have, this uh, miracle, miracle meat, I guess they're calling it. It's, it's another business and they're taking over farmland across the United States. This is happening. And yes, they want to put additional taxes on ranchers and make it so that, again, cattle, dairy, cattle, and so on do have additional costs, which are the a tax, which is so high, it is beyond even the value of the, the cattle themselves. They're talking about, you know, for example, $12 for a gallon of milk, uh, things like this, for example. Bizarre situation. Will this get rid of the meat industry? Probably not, because outside the U.S., I guarantee people are not going to stop eating meat. I guarantee you our friends in France are not going to stop eating cheese and so on. Uh, but in the United States, it might be very hard very soon to get meat, to get beef, or to get milk, for that matter, unless you're very, very wealthy. They have been talking about these policies for a long time, in addition to that, making it so that basically meat is a luxury good. Uh, something very expensive you can have sometimes, but only the wealthy elite get to have it regularly. Uh, they they have been talking about this for a long time. And yes, based on, so I've read some several stories on it today. In fact, uh, they are talking about this as part of the policy within, the, uh, within this $3.5 trillion bill they're trying to get through. Uh, another question here from Linda Manning. You said, I'm on Social Security and also, I, I asked this one already, I'm sorry. This is from Cultured Yabo. You said, hi, Josh. On a long weekend here in Oz, Australia, good to see you all here. After see more butts, should we toughen more butts? But seriously, could Anthony Fauci run the CDC from jail? <laughs> I mean, you know, at this point, I don't know. I mean, typically criminal organizations can still work out of prisons. And if you, if, it, if it's a criminal organization and not a branch of our government, maybe it could still function out of prison. I guess it depends on how you look at it. Uh, funny story. So President Donald Trump uh, held a recent rally where he talked about Fauci and possibly putting him in jail specifically. Uh, but Trump said he would only put Fauci in jail for two weeks. But, you know, these things go two weeks, you know, things change, laws change. So maybe two weeks, maybe a couple of months, maybe a few years. You know how these things go, right? <laughs> Anyways, if you get Trump's humor, he's joking because Fauci's lockdown laws and so on was, remember, like the 15 or 14 days, whatever, to, to slow the spread. You know, he was telling us originally, yeah, two weeks, folks, just just two weeks will slow the spread. It'll be great. Just batten down the hatches two weeks up. It's a couple months now up. It's a few months now. Oh, it's maybe a year now. Oh, it might not ever end now. And so Trump was joking about that, about Dr. Anthony Fauci, again, the person who introduced a lot of these policies, uh, who notably has severe ties to uh, Peter Daszak and Eco Health Alliance and financing research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, including on viruses such as the horseshoe bat um, at that laboratory, uh, making them more able to infect human cells and including things like this that sound a whole lot like COVID. Uh, but of course, um, they have also been trying to suppress this as Anthony Fauci's emails do suggest. And for some reason, don't want people looking into it. It's a very strange development. 
Um, anyways, folks, a lot we can go on to with that. I don't, before we run out of time, and I apologize for the delay tonight, I'll go a bit longer just because we did have a bit of, of a weird outage. I do apologize for that again, and thanks for sticking with us through that. But I want to talk about what's happening with this budget because there's some there's some bizarre things going on. And you also see a break taking place within the Democrat Party over this. It's, it's a very interesting development we're watching right now. Now, I'll go over a few stories explaining the big picture with this. Now, it says here, White House, Democrats will be disappointed as party scales back Biden agenda. It says a top White House advisor said the Democrats will be disappointed as the party works to trim President Joe Biden's agenda amid party infighting. Again, folks, you have the moderate Democrats and the very far left Democrats uh, really at each other's throats right now over this. There's a lot of party infighting to the extent that Biden himself had to go meet with them. And after these meetings basically came out and said, a lot of you are going to be disappointed. Now it says here, this is although he predicted that two major components would be passed in Congress. This is a quote. It says, people will be disappointed. People will not get everything they want. That is the art of legislating. But the goal here is to not is to get both bills, and we're going to fight until we get both bills. I'll explain what those are. It's according to Cedric, Rich, uh, Cedric Richmond, director of the White House Office of Public Engagement, who told us to meet the press on Sunday. Now, late last week, infighting between moderate and leftist members of the Democratic Party, far left, uh, over the $1.1 trillion infrastructure bill and the $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill prompted a Capitol Hill visit by Biden. Again, folks, $4.6 trillion spending proposed in addition to all the other spending we have. However, Biden left the meeting on October 1st, admitting to reporters that no deal is intact. They weren't able to make a deal even with Biden present. More moderate Democrat lawmakers have sought an immediate vote on the infrastructure bill, which passed along bipartisan lines several weeks ago in the House. House typically is more far left than the Senate. A lot of things that the House Democrats push do not make it through the Senate. But progressives have said that the first needs to be an agreement to pass the $3.5 trillion measure, which would bolster, they say, climate initiatives and social welfare programs. In other words, folks, a new deal. This time, a green new deal of sorts. And those of you maybe remember, of course, the new deal uh, was, of course, how socialism was heavily introduced into the United States. Uh, there's some deeper history to it, of course, but the New Deal was when a lot of these social welfare programs started. The Green New Deal is kind of the next step in the rise for this, implementing more socialist policies under the Trojan horse of climate change. Now, on that note, they're saying that it's the squad is claiming that the new budget bill is too small to get their priorities in because the current proposal is $1.5 trillion instead of $3.5 trillion. And the White House economic advisor, meanwhile, as they're proposing over, over $4.6 trillion in spending, the White House economic advisor is now saying there's higher inflation likely to stick around much longer. And meanwhile, folks, as they're talking about inflation sticking around much longer, you're having at the lower levels of well, on the ground here in the United States, serious issues being caused in the basic grassroots of the American economy. New York City restaurants are saying right now that business is down 40 to 60 percent due to vaccine mandates because maybe they lost more than half their business roughly uh, because of the vaccine mandates. We'll see if they can even survive. Um, Chinese factories, meanwhile, are also hitting their lowest levels in 19 months because they're having a power outage crisis across China, meaning again, manufacturing and meaning again, the ports in China are even more backed up. And the back the backing up of the ports in China is causing a backing up the ports in the United States and other countries, which is where the shipping crisis is coming into place. In addition to the fact that a lot of people, because they were on un unemployment, were buying a lot of goods, which helped create this crisis you have in shipping while not wanting to work, which means you have a shortage of workers in a lot of key industries, including, for example, with truck drivers, 
Meanwhile, again, you also have, in addition to all these issues, Los Angeles cargo ships backlog peaking, supply chain issues expected for months still on this, and the Chinese real estate market bubble about to burst, going to affect very likely international markets, including here in the United States. No bailout in sight in China for that still. In addition to some other things, folks, it's not looking so hot in terms of economics. Get ready. Uh, get ready because we're at the cusp of some kind of massive economic shakeup, especially if Democrats can pass $4.6 trillion in spending, while, again, they're already concerned about us hitting the debt ceiling, which we're at right now, in which they need to raise in order to even spend this money. <sighs> Uncharted territory, like I said. Now, a few different ways you can view this. One would be, well, maybe they want it to collapse. Maybe they want to grind everything down to dust and try to remake it. A, a great reset of sorts. Uh, a way to build back better from you know the destruction of all existing institutions. Maybe that's part of the idea here. Uh, maybe it's just them not being very good with policy and not planning ahead for things like this. Maybe it's them uh, just raising the debt ceiling and weathering the storm and seeing what happens with it. We'll have to see, but there's some very strange things going on right now, uh, which do give all the signs of some kind of very, very big shakeup. Again, that we're right on the cusp of, and I'll be giving you updates on that as we go forward. Now, that said, it's getting late, so I want to go over one last story because I talked about it, and I know we're over time, but because we had the outage the weird outage. Again, I do apologize for that. <clears throat> Sorry. I want to give you one more story, uh, which is the one I mentioned earlier, which is school boards in the United States. And these are not just like local school boards. These are big school boards. They're calling on the federal government to designate and investigate parents as domestic terrorists. If, for example, you oppose things like vaccine mandates, if you oppose things, for example, like mask mandates, if, for example, you don't like your kid being taught critical race theory, you could be labeled a, a domestic terrorist if this school board gets its way. I'll explain exactly what they're talking about here. That says this. The National Organization of Public School Boards Again, not just a local one. This is the National Organization of Public School Boards. It's calling on the Biden administration to, pr to protect its members from angry mobs of parents who protest against COVID-19 restrictions placed on students and the teaching of critical race theory, characterizing the protests as domestic terrorism. Now, folks, if, if you don't like your kid being taught racist, critical race theory, which by definition is actually racist, um, di you're discriminating based on color of skin, you're even you know dividing kids according to the color of their skin in a lot of these classes. And even if you go by, frankly, just you know American law, this is discrimination. It's separating people uh, by, again, their race, and it's discriminating based on race and uh, ethnic background. But if you oppose that, you may get labeled a terrorist. Now, if you're protesting this, of course, that's your choice, right? You, you don't believe in these policies. But let's go back over uh, maybe a couple of years now when Black Lives Matter was holding similar protests across the United States, in addition to not just protesting, but even burning down businesses, killing people, looting stores, and so on, were they labeled domestic terrorists? I don't think they were, right? I think they were defended by most of these same organizations. So what is the difference now? Now it says here, the National School Boards Association, which represents more than 90,000 school boards, you know that folks, across the whole United States, 90 thousand school boards. They wrote in a September 29th letter to President Joe Biden that the federal government must, quote, deal with the growing number of threats of violence and acts of intimidation occurring across the nation. Now, the letter moves on to cite incidents of, quote, threats or actual acts of violence against school leaders, alleging that parents who sought to express their opposition to masks and COVID-19 vaccination policies have been, quote, inciting chaos during school board meetings. 
Now, has there actually been attacks on these individuals? If so, they haven't really been reporting it very well, and typically you think they would. But it also denies, they're denying that critical race theory is being taught in classrooms. Bizarre, because of course it's being implemented in, a lot, in most across a lot of the country. And in fact, you even had recent stories about them giving guide, not this board in particular, but other organizations giving guidance on how to sneak in critical race theory education, even in places where it's banned in the United States. But they're claiming the critical race theory, uh, they're, they're denying it's being taught in classrooms. And they're describing parents' attempts to hold school board members accountable by posting watch lists online as spreading misinformation. And so parents who are identifying these um, teachers or school board members uh, as individuals who've caused or again doing this to their kids, they're calling that spreading misinformation. Remember folks, some of these same school organizations are the ones even documenting kids and holding them accountable and doxing children who they say are violating mask mandates and other policies. They're doxing children in some parts of the US, but they're saying it's spreading misinformation, the school board in particular. They're saying it's spreading misinformation if you're keeping track of them. It says here, quote, as these threats and acts of violence have become more prevalent, the letter claims, NSBA, this national school board organization, respectfully asks that a joint collaboration among federal law enforcement agencies, state and local enforce law enforcement, and with public school officials be undertaken to focus on these threats. So they want public school officials to work together with state and local law enforcement while state and local law enforcement in some parts of the U.S. aren't even enforcing, aren't even responding to calls or non-emergencies anymore like in Austin. Working together also with federal law enforcement. They want, they want public school officials working with federal law enforcement, right? Working together with them such as the FBI, the Secret Services, the Department of Justice, and Homeland Security, they want them to, quote, investigate, intercept, and prevent the current threats and acts of violence, they claim, by whatever, quote, extraordinary measures necessary. What are extraordinary measures, folks, by whatever means necessary? What are they referring to here? They want, again, these massive, these federal agencies, local law enforcement to work again with members of the schools, these school board organizations. They want them to help hold extraordinary measures, things beyond, in other words, things that are beyond the ordinary, extraordinary, beyond the ordinary measures to do whatever is necessary. They say, quote, as these acts of malice, violence, and threats against public school officials have increased, the classification of these heinous acts, uh, actions could be the equivalent to a form of domestic terrorism and hate crime. Hear that, folks? They're saying you're guilty of domestic terrorism, possibly, and possibly of hate crime, they're claiming. Now, the NSBA argue, argued this in a letter, which I've been quoting from, encouraging the federal agencies to use laws designed to target domestic terrorism, such as the Patriot Act, to address the issue. And folks, the Patriot Act was, of course, enacted under the Bush administration uh, to target terrorists. And we were told this was to stop terrorists. We were thinking Afghanistan and Iraq. Now it's possibly, if the school board gets its way, targeting Americans who oppose things like vaccine mandates, mask mandates, and critical race theory being taught to their children. That's where it's heading. If this school board gets its way, we'll see if the federal government responds to it. Uh, but hey, join the club. Uh, you might have seen the articles as well claiming that Epic Times, this is General Milley, the guy who is having backroom calls with the Chinese Communist Party, uh, going against President Donald Trump, the commander-in-chief, when he was still in power, meaning that Milley was acting against the interests of the commander-in-chief while a standing general which is, well, typically maybe treason. Actually, in his notes, was calling even Epic Times and Newsweek domestic terrorist oper operations, although he denied it uh, when questioned. Uh, but here we can see that the label is being expanded. Normally, you think domestic terrorists, you think neo-Nazis, or you think KKK, or you think, you know, Taliban or Al-Qaeda and people who are out to, like, hold mass acts of violence. 
folks, they're making it now so that if you oppose mask mandates, if you oppose vaccines, uh, vaccine passports, that if you oppose critical race theory, you might get labeled that as well. We'll see what happens. We'll see if this is recognized. Of course, this is a school board calling for this, a national school board, not the federal government, but they're pushing for this. And media as well has been pushing a lot of these same narratives, calling for that label of domestic terrorists to be expanded as such. Bizarre times, folks. A lot to talk about as always. A lot more I could go into, and I do apologize for the outage tonight. That said, um, actually, uh, something you might be interested in last note, if you've been wondering some of the communist connections among top members of Congress, folks, we have a video for you to watch here. It's from Trevor Loudon's show, Counterpunch. You can watch it exclusively on Epic TV. If you want to watch that, check it out in the links in the description and in the comments. Uh, Trevor Loudon is, of course, one of the top experts on communism in the United States, and he details the communist connections of many of our top members of Congress. I'm going to put the links to that in the description below and in the comments, and I'll show you a trailer in just a bit. But as always, folks, again, always a pleasure. I'll see you again this live Q&A next, uh, this coming Tuesday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And folks, as always, please take care of yourselves, stay informed, and stay free. Thank you. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the Judiciary Committee, the most powerful committee in the U.S. Congress. A lot of people ask me, why all these communists in government? Why a pro-Chinese communist Black Lives Matter running riot on the streets? Why isn't the FBI doing something about these people? Because the FBI is overseen by the Judiciary Committee. It is the committee that they look to for guidance, sets their budget, etc. The Judiciary Committee is chock full of communists and socialists. We need to be investigating Congress members for violating their oath and working in the interest of internal communists and foreign powers, because it's going on right now.